It's a desire we all share, to lead a rich, fulfilling, happy life. But you can't always get what you want. Why are we so fickle? Why is it that, that one day the things that make us happy, the next day bring us misery? This emotional life is a roller coaster, taking us from the heights of ecstasy to the depths of despair and every place between. All emotions have a role in a healthy life. We're not automatons. I'm Dan Gilbert, and in this series, I'm going to introduce you to everyday people who are searching for happiness, as well as to the scientists and clinicians who are trying to help them find it. Part of what I've taken away from this work is the resilience of the human spirit. It is just amazing what we can go through and be okay. At first, I thought I was going crazy. The dreams, the nightmares, but I'm not letting it beat me. What more can I say? I'm a happy camper. <laughs> we'll explore the obstacles to happiness. Emotions such as fear, sadness, and anger. Have I lost it to the point where I did feel like I've lost it? Yeah. I went through like six or seven years of real depression. I just was never quite given the right pill. We'll see what happiness is, what causes it, and why we look for it in all the wrong places. I used to think that things would make me happy. More money, success. I'm realizing now that that's not the fact. Happiness comes from within. But first we'll see how our greatest source of happiness lies in the people around us. Exploring how our relationships go right, how they go wrong, and what we can all do to make them better. I went out and I did things that I regret. There's a certain space in my wife's heart that I don't have anymore, and I want to win that space back. Coming up, family, friends, and lovers on This Emotional Life. I traveled to Cape Coral, Florida to meet Debbie Johnston. She and her teenage son, Jeff, had learned about bullying the hard way. This one was taken Christmas time there with Mickey Mouse. And uh, I guess this one's a favorite at the edge of the volcano in Hawaii. He was an extremely happy kid. He was smart creative, described a lot by a lot of people as just an old soul. It's my ninth birthday in this picture, and one of my guests was Jeffrey. He was like the life of the party, like everybody loved Jeffrey. Well, I first met him in seventh grade language arts class, and that was because of him probably the most fun class I've ever been in. <laughs> He seems to be a lovely and loved child. So what happened? He was head over heels for a little girl in his class. And that's when the telephone calls began. This boy in Jeff's class called the house, and he was calling Jeff a stalker and threatening him uh, to keep away from her and telling him that everybody didn't like him. This bully just had a unique capacity to go right for the spot that hurt. We want to know about your experiences, and particularly about experiences with other kids in school. For more than a decade, Dr. Yana Yuvonen has studied bullying, why it happens, and what can be done about it. She and her colleagues have been tracking 2,300 children in Los Angeles as they move from middle through high school. Who are the coolest kids in your grade is number three, and by cool, we mean popular. Essentially, the bully wants to intimidate, um, humiliate the victim in the presence of many others. The bully needs the audience. What we find in our research is that bullies are actually considered popular. Often, they are considered the cool kids, so they have social status. 
Other species do that too. That is, if you think about um, monkey troops, who's the dominant leader? It's the one who has shown everybody else that I'm the powerful, I'm the mighty. So what we have learned about Yuvonen's research has overturned a popular misconception, kind of pro namely, that being bullied um, builds character. We have learned during the past decade that these experiences of bullying don't help kids develop thicker skin, but often thinner skin. Jeff Johnston was relentlessly bullied for over a year and was extremely fragile when he and his friends set out to design an online game. We've spent weeks and weeks on the game and the password is given out to me, Jeff, and a few of me and Jeff's closest friends. And one of our friends, I guess, gave it to him, gave it to the bully. He got on there, deleted everything, and then posts like really mean things on there about Jeff. Jeff's a fag, Jeff's, Jeff's this, Jeff's that, uh, Jeff should die, blah, 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 just horrible things. That whole, you know, section of Jeff's life, it was almost like um, it wasn't erased, it was amputated. Although Jeff's tormentors went to unusual lengths, this type of humiliation is all too common. About one third of all students between the ages of 12 and 18 report being bullied every year. Does everyone understand what mob mentality means? So what can be done to stop it? In Brooklyn, New York, Blessed Sacrament School is dealing with a bullying problem of its own. When I started here, I would say teasing was done on a daily basis, and it would lead up to weekly intervals of bullying. Internet bullying started. Three girls were actually involved in it. Uh, they were on MySpace. And one of the girls found out the other girl's password. And the other kids on MySpace were going to her page and reading all these horrible things about her. You know, emotions are great, but unless they're handled well, they're not great. The school turned to Yale psychologist, Dr. Mark Brackett. His emotional literacy program trains teachers so that they can help students understand the emotional impact of bullying and respond to it more effectively. Our goal is to teach children how to identify how they're feeling. Frustrated. Giving children the words to describe their feelings. What other sort of emotions might be relevant there? Rage. Rage. We see emotional literacy as sort of a protective factor. The most important thing that our work does is teaching children how to handle themselves better. So, for example, you know, they're in a classroom and there's a bully, and the bully makes them feel bad about themselves. What strategies do they have? Because when they can identify how they're feeling, it gives them the opportunity to ask for help. I was always taught in my education courses of don't smile in class till January. You don't want to give them the emotional part of it. And now this guy's coming in telling me, hey, Let's show your emotions, share them. These kids all have these emotions, and they're just frustrated because they don't know how to express them. I implement an emotional word every two weeks. Empathy, relating to and understanding another person's feeling. And then I ask the students, can you tell me of a time you felt this emotion? I had a best friend. Everyone made fun of her because she was different. I felt so bad for her. her Giving students an emotional vocabulary can help them cope with bullying. But research suggests that the most effective way to eliminate it is to teach students to stand up for each other. But this only works when school authorities send a clear message that bullying will not be tolerated. She didn't call me, she didn't tell me she was sick. We know from playground observation studies that, that if another kid intervenes, bullying stops within seconds. Um, we also know that very few kids are willing to do that and do do that. So what we need to do is to try to address the bystanders, the onlookers, by 
being somewhat passive, just maybe occasionally smiling, they're encouraging the bully and bullying behavior. But moreover, we have to provide support that enables them to gain the confidence to go and challenge the bully or just stand up for the victim. I don't feel that there is a bullying problem here in the school I'm at today. Students treat each other with common social courtesies. They're empathetic. They're sympathetic. They're respectful. They're just generally nicer to one another. In the case of Jeff Johnston, his mom went to the school authorities. The teacher talked to Jeff's class about bullying with little impact. We thought we were doing the right thing, but it, it only made it worse. What went wrong? Why is the intervention by the school so ineffective? You know, it's just one child's word against the other. Even though you know the truth, because you can't prove it, you can't stop it. The school didn't have the power to intervene with requiring students to get counseling. As the bullying continued, Jeff became increasingly isolated, withdrawing from his relationships with the very people who might have helped him. By the end of eighth grade year, he was a very quiet kid. He would just kind of sit in the classroom and not say anything to anyone. When nobody intervenes, kids are actually interpreting that as everybody approves of what's going on. And that creates a false norm for the group where people are even more reluctant to go and try to defend or help the victim because they think everybody's accepting of this. Jeff was never the same. That just inner core of happiness that just shone like a light from him was just gone. We had plans. The War of the Worlds was opening the next day, and he was actually really excited about it. He, he loved uh, science fiction, and next morning I went to wake him up. When we opened the bedroom door, we saw him hanging in the closet. He was already gone. All that was going through my mind is he's gone and he's never gonna come back. It was horrible. I remember screaming like really loud. It's the most devastating thing I've ever been through in my entire life to this day. His last words to his family and friends, he said, don't blame anyone. The world can't change. And all I could think of is, we can't let this happen again. We have to change it. And so I took all the evidence and all the statements to the detectives who, who investigated the case. And they said, well, there's no doubt about what happened. The trouble is, is it's not against the law. I was angry, probably angrier than I've ever been. And uh, I fired off an email to our governor, Jeb Bush. And Governor Bush, he wrote, we need a law. Debbie Johnston accomplished her emotional three-year mission this week with the passage of Jeffrey's Law. With state funding on the line, it requires schools to adopt proven anti-bullying rules. Jeffrey's Law takes the burden of proof away from victims and requires teachers and administrators to take real steps to stop any reported case of bullying. When I saw her, she was on a date with somebody and I was on a date with somebody. And when we saw each other, we was on a date with each other after that. We never even went back to check on the people who we was with. We just sat and spoke for about an hour. That was so rude. I feel so bad, but I couldn't help it. And we had our own date. Right he talked with me the whole night. We were standing right about here. That was the moment. That was when I felt fire and desire. <laughs> she was so beautiful to me, and 
all aspects. Like she looked good, she was funny, she was smart, she was sweet. Like I was just into her. I used to call her my little African queen. When you're a young man, you're just nuts. I mean, so to speak. But but you are. I mean, it's like you're just driven. You just got a hunger. You want to touch, feel. You want to you want to grab. You want to be in love. You want to have sex all the time. In my teens and twenties, all I wanted was that high, the sort of cocaine of love. I miss her when she's not at the house. I'll call her on her cell phone. Where are you? I just want to hear the voice. Uh, you know, this is my life uh, for, for 28 years. Yeah, I live for romantic love. <laughs> I live too much for it, working on my love addiction. The honeymoon period was the first year for me and Phil. Oh, wow, the, the, the second going into third? Oh my gosh, that was, I was really stressed out. but I knew what I wanted and I knew my capabilities. I was ready, willing, and able to take care of my children. That's, that's not hard to me. The hardest part, honestly, is me and my husband. Sometimes I just, I just want her to myself and I can't have her to myself. Because we got to do the kids, you know? And sometimes we don't get to spend as much time with each other as we want to. The evidence is quite clear that people who do have children are less satisfied in their relationship than people who don't have children. At the same time, there is evidence that people who have children are more likely to stay married. So children have this paradoxical effect whereby it decreases the level of satisfaction within a relationship, but it increases the stability within a relationship. You strike up that defensive attitude in me. Monica, I asked three people that know me Am I, de am I a defensive person or a receptive person? You're not receptive with me. Because you're too critical, that's why. No, I am not. He says that I don't understand. I don't think he understands. <laughs> so we are two people who don't understand. I'm blunt and I'm sure of myself. So when I speak, Yeah, but you I'm don't a, have to that. always be like that but that's me. me as my Relax yeah. sometimes. What you mean like when you, like sometimes, yo, you want to know what I do? When you call me, if I have food in my mouth, I spit it out to talk to you, because I know you're going to be mad that I'm eating. Wait, I know wait, 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 wait. When it comes down to the, to the heated battle, we don't communicate at all. The communication dies. It's, uh, you know, busy sense. Why does any relationship succeed or fail? One is communication. How well are people able to convey that they value their partner? Second issue is stress. How much stress are you under? Even the very best couples, couples who communicate really well when there's no stress around, uh, they're going to falter when, they're, when uh, the husband loses a job, when the, the, the wife's mother moves in with them. My theory is that happy marriages are made of a curious combination of uh, lust and laughter and loyalty. They usually go in that direction. They run out of lust and eventually out of laughter, and they become simply packs of loyalty at a certain point. And when that happens, uh, they're in danger. I think the rubber really hits the road with love when things get difficult. So a lot of people jump ship at the first sign of conflict, at the first sign of power struggle. They're gone. It's not enough that you just have a sort of decent relationship with this person. He also has to be your best friend. He also has to be your only romantic partner. He also has to be somebody who inspires you every day. He has to be somebody who's going to help your career. He has to be somebody who co-parents with you. He has to be, like, meet you on, like, 25 different levels of intersection. And it's just this giant sack of expectation that we've piled onto the sort of wobbly head of this old institution that was never necessarily about that in the past. Much of Philip and Monica's stress comes from Phil's job as a freelance record producer. That's the, that's the original beat that Jano was rapping over? Yeah. I know he sometimes he has to spend a lot of nights at the studio, whether it's producing or engineering. I know that's part of his job. That's what feeds us. I don't even want to hear it. I'm going to just freestyle over what he's doing. Huh? 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 Music means everything to me. Huh? But sometimes I just don't want to be here doing this at all, period. 
not even for the money. Like, I got four kids and a wife at home. Sometimes it's just necessary for me to be there, you know? And it creates a lot of stress, but I deal with it, though, you know? No battle was won easy, you know? Four years after getting married, about 10% are as happy as when they first got married. 90% are not. 20, 30 years later, um, it continues to go down. I personally believe that the, the key question about human intimacy that matters is, why do intimate relationships change? How is it that they change? Why is it that we start in a relationship with such high hopes and expectations and have those expectations dash so frequently? How many times you gonna make the same mistake? Sometimes you do things wrong. I don't bother you about everything. Maybe it's just because you're doing everything wrong. Sometimes she would say things that she didn't necessarily feel in her heart, but her anger made her say these things. And I didn't know whether to take these things serious or not. So I started to take some of the things she said serious, such as she doesn't need me. And then I said, okay, I'll go out and I'll make it so that you don't have to be with me anymore. So I cheated. I wasn't really upset the fact that he cheated on me. I was upset about the fact that he lied to me when I asked him. It bothers me when anyone lies to me, but more so when a loved one who I put my trust in, you understand, lies to me. It didn't make me happy, because that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to be with my wife, but she pushed me away so much that I had to cheat. So that was just a struggle within itself, just making a decision on what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna run like I usually do, or I'm gonna stay in and just fight. We know a fair amount of what prompts people to infidelity and with whom and whether they act on it. The two main factors, not surprisingly, are your primary relationship is not going that well and there's good opportunities. In successful marriages, most people don't act on it because it's a violation of trust to the partner. Affairs happen in relationships that have accepted emotional distance, where people are lonely and they're not reaching out toward one another. So that's what has to be rebuilt. Around the world, in all 37 cultures that I studied, we found two important clusters of sex differences. Uh, one was a cluster that men valued more than women. Youth, men placed a greater premium on physical appearance than women did. It's not that women didn't value it, women do. Uh, but they don't value it as much as men. Women placed a greater emphasis on a man's uh, ambition. Does he have goals? Does he have drive? Does he have social status? Is he respected by his peers? Men value cues to fertility, uh, and women value cues to resources. Given these basic differences between men and women, maybe the real question isn't why romantic relationships end, but why they ever last. Oh, I remember this. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Steve and Rebecca Tobias have been married for 40 years, but they've had to deal with some difficult issues along the way. Yeah. Oh, this is when we met at college, 1966. No, we met in 65, December. Oh, yeah. This but, was the okay, following this spring. This was the following yeah. spring. Right. Oh, here's our wedding. There it is. We grew up together, really, even though we knew each other for two years or so before we got married. He said when we met, if you want to stick with me, you have to know that one of the things I want to do is travel around the world with a backpack someday. They traveled together across Europe and North Africa and settled in San Francisco where they renovated an old house together. I love this. Yeah, we I have was, two sons, born two years apart. Yep. I love that. Yeah. Steve and Rebecca seemed to have it right. They were doing many of the things that research tells us are critical to a happy marriage. What it takes to have a relationship that is vibrant and lively and exciting turns out from the research so far, we know at least two things that bring in the positive. One is what's called capitalization, and that is getting excited about your partner's successes and, and building on them, capitalizing on them. The other is making your life together exciting. I don't want you to hurt your arm. 
Dr. Art Aaron has been studying what happens when couples share novel and exciting experiences. I'm going to tie your legs and your arms together. So In his laboratory, he asked some couples to do a familiar task, and he asked others to do something he felt confident they'd never tried before. Okay. Go. Dr. Aaron had the couples crawl back and forth across an obstacle course, making them work together against the clock. Uh, there was even some success if they made the time limit, and we always rigged it so they did. Time, you made it. Congratulations. It's not surprising that this somewhat silly task gave couples a few minutes of fun. What is surprising is that a few minutes of fun actually changed the way these couples interacted and felt about each other. What we found is that those couples who spent the five minutes doing the exciting, novel, challenging activity had a substantially greater increase from before to after in their reported love for their partner. We think the process is basically one of association, that when you do something novel and challenging, it creates an exhilaration and excitement in your life. If that's done with your partner as a team, then that novelty and challenge is associated with the relationship. But novelty alone is not enough to sustain a marriage. Partners must also fulfill each other's needs. And sometimes their needs are in conflict. I had low self-esteem, and I had a lot of anxiety about work. When I'd come home, it was like a cloud over the house. I would brood. I'd be um, unavailable. I'd be not present. We moved several times because of job changes. So the instability and insecurity around that, around our future, made me very anxious and stressed. I think at that time, you know, I might have thought it's mostly you. The problem's mostly you, you and your insecurities. You didn't think you had a problem? I don't know that I thought I had a problem. No. Oh. Really? Yeah. When you were very depressed, you know, you, you know, you would come to me from this needy, right. kind of sad point of yeah. view, and like, right. it wasn't very attractive. You didn't approach me as a strong man. You know, I was angry, and I thought, I'm not going to take care of you in this way. So there was like, endless was uh, thinking about, um, you know, is it her, is it me, is it us, and, and uh, well, it was painful. Steve and Rebecca set aside their problems and buried themselves in the hard work of raising a family. But when their youngest left home, their difficulties reemerged and intruded into the bedroom. Steve is much more sensual and wants more physical contact than I do. Steve said to me, I want a, a sexual relationship. And if you're not willing to really work on that with me, then this isn't going to work out. I said, if I can't expect to have a next sexual encounter, it's not a marriage and I won't stay in it. I was satisfied with our companionship and our activities and so on, and that I could, I could live without a sex life. But once Steve made it very clear, I realized that I had to really look at this issue and really try to deal with it. Steve and Rebecca went to individual therapy and to couples counseling. That's what we suggested Phil and Monica try. Marriage counseling with clinical psychologist, Dr. Javier Amador. Um, how was it getting here? It was cool until we got off the train. What happened when you got off the train? Uh, I pretty much knew where I was going. I thought it was a left, but it was actually a right that I had to make. I was going the wrong way. First of all, <laughs> when, I, when Phil got off the train station, I asked him, do you know where you're going? He said, I know. As we're walking, we're already late. He says, oh, let me grab a donut. We're late already. He said, no, we have to be at 845. I said, no, we have to be at 8, 830. He's still arguing with me. I got upset. 
Because you know why? He does it all the time. He doesn't help with the situation at all. He doesn't help. He does not help. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> now he's looking at his Blackberry. And, he, and he's ignoring. See? You see? In my first therapy session, my husband was checking his Blackberry. There was no hope. He didn't really care. I feel like I'm talking to a deaf person. What's the purpose? It was difficult, because it was so much stuff bottled up inside me. I cooperated, though. I wanted to make it work, so I cooperated. Independently, what, what are you looking to get from this? We definitely need some new ways to communicate, ways to solve problems like this, because this is a reoccurring thing. I think I communicate very well. OK. But my husband says I don't communicate well with him, but I, don't, I communicate okay. well with others. So that might be a goal he has, that you would communicate better with him, but you don't think that's something you need to work I on? I think he doesn't communicate with me. One person can't be wrong all of the time. And Monica sometimes gets into a phase where every little thing I do is wrong. Just don't punish me over every little thing I do. For me, it's so important to see a couple argue and get a clear picture of whether they're arguing in a way that is destructive or a way that's constructive. You can argue in a way that brings you closer to the person you're arguing with, where you feel respected, you feel like they're listening to you, you feel the love that brought you together. They were arguing in ways that actually uh, pushed them further apart. On Monica's part, it was raising her voice and pointing out her criticisms. It wasn't just one criticism, it was two, three, four, five. And so any single argument became not a single battlefield, but a whole, you know, war. Yeah, all he sees is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course it's going to sound like, yeah, 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 if you're not listening. Phil, understandably, got overwhelmed and couldn't keep hearing it. From his perspective, everything, as he put it, he did was wrong, so why say anything at all? Now, on his side, he was, he was um, doing something that can be a very effective, positive strategy, which was kind of you know, quieting down, stopping, not talking. But he did it to the point where it really became an expression of his anger, where it became a passive aggressive strategy. I married very impulsively. I divorced very thoughtfully. Changing your life is, um, by the way, very expensive, complicated, unpleasant business. And I don't think people do it until they feel like the alternative is worse. My wife, we had a little incident where I thought we were going to break up, and that's when I knew I loved it, when I felt like, oh, man, if I lose her, I'm going to be incredibly depressed. I'm going to be so, I'm going to go insane if I don't have her. So that's when I knew, oh, sh I love this woman. I can't lose her. I better clean up my act and fix things really fast. I have never worked to keep a relationship going. I, I'm just the opposite. The first betrayal, I walk away. I was there with my my wife-to-be. And it's always great when you go to couple sessions therapy. You pray to God that your, your lover screws up in front of you, the doc. You see? You see what I have to put up with? Ah. Thank you. Relationship issues are the primary reason why anybody seeks any kind of counseling in the United States. So we naturally have to ask, does that work? Do people realize benefits from that? Laboratory studies show that it does work. Basically, that's what you said, right? No, I was All therapies focus on making conflict constructive and getting people to talk about what their needs are. And for many couples, that just those two things are a revolution in the relationship. We've done research now on what to look for in an effective therapist. If the couple really feels that they can talk to this person, the person is not judging them, and it feels safe, and there's really a connection. It's that rapport between the therapist and the client that really creates the magic of therapy. Do you think all men cheat? Can I ask you that question, honestly? Do I think all men cheat? No. I said to myself, damn, I didn't come into this relationship to make her unhappy. I came in here to make her happy and be her everything. And when I was doing my cheating thing, I really didn't care about my relationship anymore. I didn't care. I felt like she didn't want to be with me. Right now, I just I feel like punching him. You still got an open wound there. Oh, hell yeah. Okay. 
Of course. I think then. I don't trust him. I will never trust him like I trust him before. Never. You want to? I don't know. I can't answer that question right now. I have to think about that. I suspect that, you know, the long list of complaints you have maybe wouldn't be so long if you were feeling more trust. The fact is, if you can't trust your husband, how can you stay with him? I agree. Hmm. I'm not telling you you should trust him. I'm not telling you you should not trust him. I'm telling you that what I see as, a, as an underlying issue for the two of you as a couple is rebuilding that trust if you can, okay? I don't think anybody ever gets over being cheated on. I, I think that that damage to the trust um, is always going to be there. The question is, is it there as an open wound or is it there as a, as a scar? Um, I think that for Monica, if she can't forgive, and take the leap of faith to trust again. There can't be a relationship. It was like he lied about what he did. I don't know if Monica sees what was happening in the relationship and her contribution to it. It doesn't absolve him of the ultimate responsibility by any means, but it, it broadens the sense of responsibility in terms of how do I relate to my partner. Here's the, here's a problem for both of you. There, there is no absolute truth. We can get 10 people lined up, and we can get 10 different votes on it. And you're both going to be right, and you're both going to be wrong. And so that's not how you resolve arguments. And I think emotions are, are never right or wrong. They're always right. From the perspective of the person feeling the emotion, it's the truth. It's what I feel. One of the things that you can learn to do is to really understand and respect each other's point of view. Yes, even if, we're, even if I'm wrong, I want to feel respected. Okay. Like I was heard. Like you were heard? Yes. OK. When you do this kind of work, you, you really are trying to help people see what they can change in themselves first. Because if they're so myopically focused on trying to change their partner, that's actually how they got into the, the bad place they're in. Because you can't change the other person. You can focus on changing yourself. Well, I'm sorry I was so cranky. You know, you can't hurt my feelings as easy as you used to. <laughs> I had this image that to be really competent, you're an administrator, you're an executive. And so I spent, I don't know, 12 or 15 years trying to be a middle manager and really not doing it well, doing it very poorly and, and getting depressed. I think the one thing that made the big difference was finally letting go of that idea of making a lot of money or being a big shot. I'm doing a much less ambitious kind of work, and I'm getting a lot of pleasure. I'm, I'm, I do counseling now. I see people who are hurting, and uh, I'm good at it. And uh, it feels good to do it. We don't have much on the list. I grew up with a misunderstanding of what sex was all about. The views that I had, even from very young in my life had to do with the role of the woman as being there to meet the needs of a man and to not meet her own needs. At times I did think, this is too hard. I just want out of this situation. We build up a whole world and a whole idea about who we are. Mm -hmm. I'm a person who, you know, has these points of view, and I see the world in this way. And then I had to shed all of that. I had I to sh all. shed all of this years and years and years of an idea of who I was and how I related to men and the whole thing. And it was very hard. Yeah. But it was worth it. Was it? Yeah, I'm only sorry I didn't do it sooner. Phil, just so I can get the big picture, when did your father pass away? Uh, when I was about two. H how did he pass away? Do you mind if uh, I... Murder. He was murdered? Yes. Sorry. 
Okay, so when you were two, this happened. Mm -hmm. So you, you, do you have any memory of your father at all? I definitely remember him putting a basketball in my crib, and I remember that basketball. I remember hugging the basketball, trying to hold it. You know what I'm saying? I definitely remember that. Mm. It meant a lot to you. That's why I love basketball so much. And, and that's your only memory of him? Of him, yeah, that's the only memory. That's amazing. Like, I didn't know that. So now I understand why. It was like a light bulb went off my head, like, oh my gosh. I think the biggest change I, I saw in Monica, which makes me very um, optimistic about her, is empathy. And with that realization, you know, she's also revealing the love she has for him. And, and, and it was apparent in the moment that she had it that um, this was where she was motivated to change. I wasn't letting him express himself. I wasn't basically listening to him. Listening goes a long way when you listen to somebody. It really does. And sometimes it's better to listen. Be the receiver, because you'll learn a lot more. I'm only one person. I'm doing everything in my power right now yeah. wow. to go to the next level and to move forward or whatever. Good. Yeah. Then, then you're not going to mind that I'm giving you three hours of homework <laughs> between now and the next time we meet, right? Three hours? Okay. Can you have one date? Ooh, a date? Can you have a date? Yes. Can you fit that in? Yes, we yes. can definitely fit it. OK, no complaints allowed okay. during that date. If you have the impulse, even if it feels artificial, don't do it. Look for something it's to so do. It's so hard. You can't stop arguing for two Once hours? Once I go, I go. <laughs> we can stop. We can. I can. It's real simple. My date with Phil, it was nice. It was really nice. We haven't did that in a have we ever done that before? <laughs> you have to think. Thank you. For just me and him and candles, the last time I think we did something really romantic like that was at our wedding. We did a lot of communicating lately. Mm -hmm. And I let her know a lot of things that was really on my mind. You know, not not just to argue about them, or not even really to just discuss them, just to let her know how I felt about certain things, and it felt good for me. I think Phil's epiphany was that he can't just shut up and let it all uh, settle down, that when he stops talking, it makes Monica crazy. He's learned that he's got to find a way of communicating that she can hear. Mother, father, son, daughter, husband, wife, partner, friend. These are the one word descriptions that tell the stories of our lives. When we come together as family, as friends, as lovers, we become more than the sum of our parts.